Hello and welcome back to the Little Craft House. For those of you who don't know me, I am Nicole and I love to make polymer clay earrings. I recently made these fun, colourful, spotty earrings and so I thought I would do a tutorial to show you guys how I made them. They are quite simple to make, so they're perfect if you're a beginner, but I've also jam-packed the tutorial full of tips and tricks along the way for how to make polymer clay earrings. So join me now as I show you how I made them. So I'm going to start by gathering up a bunch of polymer clay. This is a great design if you have small amounts of leftover clay or some one-off colours from colour mixing scraps. I'm using a combination of all of these things here. I'm using a couple of different brands as well, including Sculpey Primo, Sculpey Souffle, Sculpey 3 and Fimo. I'm pretty sure that the pink is just some mixed up scraps as well as that teal colour. Um, I think it's pretty much straight from the pack, but it does have a bit of a glitter mixed through it as well. I want to have a large selection of colours, so really the more that I can gather, the better. The navy blue that I'm using for the base is Fimo Professional. It's a chunk of leftover from a previous project, so it has a little bit of blue foil through it. And I'm going to mix some of the fresh stuff through it as well. And hopefully the foil won't be too noticeable, but if it is, it doesn't really matter because it's just going to be for the base. My cutting skills here look super awkward and it really did look like I was going to cut my fingers off then, but I didn't, so I don't know quite how I was holding that knife. Anyway, I'm going to get it nice and warmed up and conditioned first. Um, this will make it soft and pliable to work with. So I'm just going to warm it up in my hands a little bit um, and then I'm going to get my acrylic roller before I pass it through the pasta machine a few times. You want to make sure that you have conditioned your clay before you pop it through the machine. Um, otherwise, it puts a little bit too much stress on the mechanisms of your pasta machine and that will then result in it breaking or not working to its best ability. So the top tip for when you're conditioning, whether you're rolling it through um, the pasta machine or with the acrylic roller, always try to make sure that your folds are on the side. This will help to push any air out that side bit rather than getting trapped within the clay and then resulting in air bubbles coming out in your pieces as you bake. I mentioned before about working with Sculpey 3. This lilac colour here is Sculpey 3. And sometimes it gets a little bit of a bad rap. Um, I think mainly because it's a soft clay, which means that it will be more prone to cracking and have strength issues if it's used as the main clay of your project. Generally, I don't recommend it to be used as a base clay, but if you're just using it for decorations on top, that's usually fine. So now I've conditioned up all my pieces of clay, I'm going to pass each one of them through the pasta machine on the thinnest setting, about one to one and a half millimetres. I didn't mention before, but my base I set to about two and a half millimetres, which is a little bit thinner than my usual size, but we're going to be layering, so I want to avoid them being too thick and too heavy. Now this little set of cutters are so handy. If you've seen any of my videos before, I do use them all the time for a number of different things. But today I'm going to be using them to create the circles. So we sell them in our store for only a couple of dollars and there's about six or seven sizes in the pack. I'm going to choose to use the three biggest sizes today and I'll be able to use both ends to cut the circles out. So it'll give me six sizes in total. As much as I love this set of cutters, unfortunately the clay can get stuck inside and it can be a little bit tricky to remove. So I've got a few tricks to try and avoid that. So the first trick that I do is that I work on a tile. So hopefully my clays are gonna to stick to the tile and then when I cut the circles out, hopefully it stays stuck to the tile rather than getting stuck in the cutter. I'm just giving the clays a little roll and a push down onto the tile to try and get them to bond to the tile before I start cutting. Now, the Sculpey 3s and Primos and Fimos do stick to the tile a little bit better than Souffle. Uh, I think because Souffle is a matte finish, it doesn't stick as nicely. I also have a matte finish tile that I work on for filming purposes, um, less reflections. So yeah, they don't necessarily stick quite as well. 
Now, some people do like to use corn flour or also a bit of cling wrap on top of their clay to try and avoid them getting stuck in the cutters. Personally, I don't use those techniques, but what I do have is just a little pokey tool on standby at the side, just in case I need it to help me poke those circles out. The red cutter from this set is actually one of my most used cutters. I find that the red end is my favorite size for doing stud toppers and the metal end is perfect. It's just a little bit smaller for just doing studs. Whenever I make a slab for earrings, once I've cut my components out, I try to use any of the uncut parts to cut out as studs. So that, that way I can make stud packs or I can use them as freebies or giveaways when people purchase my earrings. So once I've finished cutting out all the circles, I'm just gonna peel back those extra bits of clay and just watch out for any circles that may get stuck. And I'm just gonna pop these skeleton bits to the side. I'm not sure if I'm gonna have enough circles for the project, so I may need to cut some more afterwards. So I'll just bunch them all up and pop them to the side in case I do need them again. Now I do have to say this has been the most brightest, funnest project that I've had on my desk for ages. When I've looked at my camera roll of all my bits that I've filmed for this tutorial, the color on my camera roll has been amazing. So much fun, so many colors. Because I bonded the clays to the tile before so that the circles would stick to the tile and not in my cutter, I now need to release them from the tile. So I'm using my flexi blade. As the name suggests, this blade is flexible, so I'm able to bend it and scrape it underneath of the pieces to lift them up. It is a technique that takes a bit of practice and some of these pieces I did chop into a little bit, so I'm just gonna chuck those rejected ones to the side. But it is the best and easiest technique to remove your clay from your tile without distorting the pieces. So this next part is probably the most tedious and longest part of making this slab. I need to neaten up and tidy the circles that we cut out. So especially because I use the flexi blade to lift them, any of those little scrappy bits that were left on the tile may have stuck to these circles as well. So I'm just gonna hold them in my fingers and roll them around, smoothing the edges, cutting off with the knife if any of the pieces didn't cut through properly, and yeah, just sorting them out along the way whilst I go. It's important to do this at this stage as we're gonna be layering the circles onto the base clay. And once they're on the clay, they won't be able to be neatened and tidied. They also won't be able to be sanded or smoothed once they're baked. So we have to do all that work now. Okay, now for the fun bit. So I'm gonna start with the larger circles and place them down first. I'm gonna fill the gaps with the smaller pieces afterwards and I'm wanting this to be completely random. So I'm not gonna follow any sort of pattern. I'm just gonna place them down sort of wherever I feel like, but I'm gonna try not to put two of the same colors together. That's why it was important that we chose lots of colors to start with so that there's lots of randomness to it. I'm just using my little scalpel knife to help me lift and place the circles in position. And I'm gonna just lightly press them down at the moment, which will allow me to move them later if I need to. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm just gonna be assembling this slab. So if you're wanting to fast forward through this bit, feel free to, otherwise I'm gonna have it on three times speed, add some funky music and enjoy watching me place it together.
So I think I am officially in love with this design. The bright colors are just amazing. Um, it's actually inspiring me to do this in a whole bunch of different color themes. I'm thinking pastels, um, monotone, like black and white, grays. Yeah, I'm really just loving this. So now I'm happy with all of the positioning, I'm just gonna do a quick little clean up. So I'm gonna use some isopropyl alcohol and just a little Q-tip. I've also got a baby wipe on standby too. So the alcohol will remove any bits of stuck lint or dirt or dust. And I'm gonna try not to apply too much because if you do, it kind of reacts with the clay a little bit, becomes a little bit soggy and it starts to remove some of the coloring of the clay. If you have ever worked with polymer clay before, you'll know how easy it is for it to become dirty, especially those lighter colors like the yellow and the greens and the pinks actually too. So the isopropyl being on standby is the best thing to have because um, it is a very quick and easy way to clean them up. It's also a great way to remove any fingerprints as well, especially if you are creating things that you're holding more, so things like beads and things. Um, yeah, the isopropyl helps to remove those fingerprints too. And as usual, it is always easier to do the clean up while the clay is raw rather than waiting until afterwards when it's baked. Now that it's all cleaned up and I'm happy with all the positioning, as I mentioned before, the pieces were only lightly pressed down as I was positioning them. So I'm just using my roller now to bond the clays together properly. So I only want to do a light roll. I don't want to press too hard as that will distort the circles. If you find that as you're doing the roller over the top, your little circles are lifting, just pop a piece of baking paper down first and then roll over the top of that. Okay, now is the most difficult part and that is choosing which cutters I want to use. Sometimes when I create a slab, I know exactly what shapes I want to create, but this time I'm not exactly sure. I definitely do like the circle because I like the idea of the circle with circles inside of it. But I just grabbed a bunch of colors that jumped out at me and I'll see how many I can fit onto this slab. Obviously, I want to get as much as possible out of it, so I just need to try and work out my positionings. Okay, so once I got all the shapes that I wanted um, on the slab cut out, I'm just gonna use up any leftover space to cut any toppers and studs that I can get from the gaps because I wanna waste the least amount of possible of this slab because it is so bright and colorful and fun. In a minute, I will be sharing with you a couple of ideas for using up these scraps. So I'm just gonna pull this skeleton off and I'm gonna place it to the side because we are gonna use it again in a minute. And once again, I'm just going to use my flexi blade to lift up the pieces from the tile. I'll just put them to the side there for a second. And in a minute, I'm just going to give them a little bit of a tidy up. 
So I'm just going to smooth around the edge of the paces and this will mean less sanding that will need to be done later. I've got this handy little silicon tip tool here and this just helps me to get into the corners of the tricky shapes like the arms of the jumpers. I'm also just using my knife to trim off any bits that didn't cut through properly as well. I'm also giving them one last check for any lint or dirt that may be stuck to them so that I can get it off with the isopropyl before we pop them in the oven. I'm just going to grab some of my scrap clay that I had from the beginning and I'm just going to cut some coordinating shapes out of them for toppers. I think having plain tops will look quite nice with these because being such a busy pattern, I think the plain tops will just set them off nicely. So I made these plain pieces the same thickness as the original blue base. That way there will be a consistent thickness with the base and those toppers. The circles are obviously 3D so they will stick out a little bit higher. But again, I don't want these pieces to be too chunky and heavy. So I just made the toppers the same as the base piece. Okay, so now it's time to pop them onto the baking tray. So I line my baking tray with a piece of baking paper and I usually bake for approximately an hour at about the 130 degree mark. I generally find that the baking instructions that come on the packet are just not long enough. Um, so yeah, you can definitely bake polymer clay longer than what it says on the packets, but just don't bake it any hotter. I'm quite often asked about which ovens I use as well. I have a little benchtop oven that I use as well as my home oven. Right, so whilst they bake, I thought I would show you some cool ideas of things to do with the scraps. Probably like many of you guys, I hate to have wasted clay scraps and unused bits of clay hanging around. And these scraps are so pretty and colorful that it would be a shame not to use them in some way. So I cut out as much as I possibly could and then this is just the little bit of skeleton that's left. I'm gonna take the bits and chop them with my knife into pieces that are of similar sizes and stack them on top of each other like this. I want it to be in a bit of a log shape, so I'm just going to push it together as I go to try and squeeze out any bits of air that may be trapped in there. And I'm just going to add in any of those little scrappy bits that are just hanging around on my tile as well. And once I've got it all together, I'm just gonna use my pressing plate here to compact it and squeeze it together even more. Uh, we do sell these little plates in our store, but if you don't have one, a ruler does work really well as well, especially the clear ones, because you can actually see what's going on underneath of it. Once I'm happy with the squishing, I'm gonna find the best way to slice it up. So I like to chop a piece from the end and a piece from the side and see how the patterns have formed. I think I like the small way best as it kind of reminds me of fireworks. So I'm going to cut the rest of it up into even pieces and then I'm going to make a new little mini slab. If you cut your pieces thin, you can always pop them onto a base piece. Otherwise, if they are thick enough, you can just tile them together like this and give them a quick little rollover to bind them all together. If a piece that you've cut looks a little bit boring, don't forget to check the back of it because sometimes the pattern on the back is just as nice as the pattern on the front. Now, for some reason, I didn't film the cutting of my shapes from this, but I did cut two little Christmas trees from it, and I'll just pop a picture in to show you what I did in just a second. Okay, so obviously I was left with some scraps then from that piece. So I'm just going to scrunch them together. I'm going to add in the little bits of rejected circles that I had put to the side. And again, I'm just going to squish it and squeeze it 
get out all the air, make it into like a log shape again. Then I'm going to start twisting it. Um, as you can see, all the colours twist nicely around it. Um, so just twisting and rolling and twisting and rolling until I'm happy. Um, and folding in half and twisting as well. Then I'm just going to roll it flat to get a bit of a marbled effect. Um, instead of rolling flat, I maybe could have just sliced it straight down the middle, had two pieces and rolled them together. Um, when you do it like this though, don't forget to check the back because sometimes the back, which it does in this case, is prettier than what the front is. And I'm just going to use my droplet shape to cut out some pieces from this one. It's funny with this droplet shape because I've only just rediscovered it. I haven't used it in ages and now I've decided that I really like it again and I'm using it all the time. And so with the last little bit of scrap that I've got to the side here, I'm just going to ball it all together, um, flatten it out and pop it to the side. I'll probably use it for something like silk screening or maybe putting some foil over the top of it later, but I don't think I'm going to get some nice symmetrical patterns out of it to make a pair of earrings. So I'll just pop it to the side and I'll use it for something later. Okay, so my pieces are now baked and I really do love them so much. They're definitely going to make some really fun earrings. So I often get asked about the finishing parts of making earrings. So I'm just going to briefly go over it with you guys now. Um, there's obviously a lot more to it and I could probably do a whole video just on that. But we'll just briefly go over it now because finishing can be something that is personal preference. Um, you'll find things that you like to do that may be different to what I do. But I'll just give you guys a quick rundown about how I finish off my pieces. So this is my Dremel drill and I use this for both sanding and for drilling holes. So when I sand, I just run it around the underneath of my pieces and that will just smooth it off. And then I run it around the sides, which will help to take off any of that color that has dragged down with the cutter. I use a buffing pad for this as it's less abrasive than the actual sanding tips that come with the drill. So once they're sanded and drilled, I like to give them a really good clean off. Today I'm going to use a baby wipe. Sometimes if I'm feeling motivated enough, I'll give them a bath in a bit of warm soapy water and that just gets rid of all the drilling dust. Now I haven't filmed the actual processes of drilling or sanding because I like to do that in an area that is away from where I use my raw clay. So it's a really hard for me to film that because I don't have my camera set up in that area. But when I do drill the holes, I like to use a drill bit that's about two millimeters in width. I had to buy a separate drill bit from the drill along with a piece that holds it in. When you're drilling your earrings that have raised components like this, sometimes it's easier to turn your pieces upside down and drill from the back. I find that helps to avoid the drill bit slipping and it's also easier to focus on the placement of the hole without getting distracted by your pieces that are on top. Now, as I want these pieces to stay with a matte finish, I'm not going to add any sort of gloss or glaze or varnish or resin to these. As a general rule, polymer clay doesn't need to be sealed with anything unless you've used an addition of some sort, for example, paint or foil or glitter. And in that case, you will need to protect it. But as I haven't used anything for these earrings, I don't need to. So I'm just going to leave them as is. So when it comes to assembling, I generally like to use eight millimeter jump rings. These ones here are gunmetal black, and I also have a stash of rose gold, silver, gold, um, a few other colors to the side, just so I can match what color best suits. But recently I've been trialing some colored jump rings that we're gonna have in our shop soon. These ones are 10 millimeters, so they're a little bit bigger than what I'm used to using. But I thought I'd give them a go today as I thought that'd be perfect for these colorful earrings. Now I have to apologize, as last time I filmed the process of putting my earrings together, I did it out of the camera shot. And so today I've actually done the same again. I don't know why, but I think it's the angle my camera's set up on, but I just tend to be working just out of screenshot there. So I'm gonna try and talk you, back, talk you through it the best I can. So I like to use two pairs of pliers for opening and closing the jump rings. The flat nose works best, but I've also got a pair of round nose pliers here too.
So I like to construct my paces first um, by doing all the jump rings first and then afterwards I will turn them all over and glue the backs or the posts onto the toppers. Now some people like to glue the posts on first before they assemble them but for some reason I don't know why I like to assemble them first and then glue the posts on. When it comes to choosing what size post to glue onto the back of your earrings, always try and choose the largest pad size that will fit onto your topper. This will just mean that there is more space for the glue to hold on and is less likely that it's going to fall off. Now I'm not sure if you can see here, but when I open the jump rings, I twist them from back to front and that just opens them nicely sideways, which means when I close it, that two ends meet up nice and perfectly together again, if that makes sense. Now, when we're talking about gluing our earring posts on, it can be quite a controversial subject. Um, for me, I use Uhu Super Glue, and for me, that has always worked really well. Um, you may find something else that works better or different for you. Um, it is just a lot of trial and error uh, into which you like best. Now, when it comes to glue, no glue will be 100% perfect. Um, there will always be different factors which will lead to how successful your glue is. So it comes down to how much glue you use. It also comes to environmental factors and things like that. And I think that climate must play a part in that as well. But that is a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. But anyway, I like to use the Uhu Super Glue. That has worked well for me for many years and I wear my earrings all the time. And yeah, that's, that's the one that I like to use best. And so that brings us to the end of the tutorial for today. So thank you so much for joining me and I hope that you've enjoyed watching me create this little collection. Hopefully you've picked up some little tips and tricks along the way too. So please don't forget the usuals, likes and subscribes are always appreciated. And if you're interested in seeing more from me, also head over and check out my Instagram. Thank you once again and I hope to see you next time. Bye.